Is it possible that those that are study uh, the Asian Kermit or Egypt, this case, because that is how the West prefer to call it, um, just decide to look for evidence to support a particular claim and leave every other thing out of it? Is it possible like that? Yeah, I mean, I think for sure that's one explanation. I think there are multiple explanations. Part of it is that um, excavating in the Sahara Desert, it's a very forbidding environment. So it's quite difficult to do archeology span in that area. But we know that in ancient times, so now I'm talking like pre, pre-Kemet, in, in very, very ancient times, the Sahara was not a desert. And this, this, what I'm about to talk about now is what's called the Green Sahara. So what is now the Sahara Desert, what had been um, a, a fertile area, and we know that people migrated across that area. And, and people who study petroglyphs, which are ancient drawings on rocks, um, those, those rock drawings are, were made by these ancient people who were traveling across this green Sahara. And so we know that there were connections between populations in the Northern and more central areas of Africa, because this wasn't a forbidding environment. There was no barrier of a desert like there is today. Um, so there were for sure connections, um, not just along the Nile Valley, but elsewhere um, in Africa, in this northern and central area of Africa. But, but yeah, I mean, part of it is like lack of interest in looking at it, but part of it is difficulty in finding the evidence because of the forbidding landscape today. But that doesn't mean that no one's doing the work. People are. Um, so, so I'll just throw out a couple of names. Um, uh, David Wengro is one person who works on this Green Sahara time period and works on ancient migrations. Um, Stuart Tyson Smith also does this sort of work. Um, and there are many others, um, many other uh, scientists, so people outside of the field of Egyptology, scientists who work on like ancient climate, for instance, um, ancient geography, geographical um, systems, climate systems, um, these sorts of people are much more familiar with, with Green Sahara from a climatological standpoint, and they write about it in, in that respect. And then um, Egyptologists, anthropologists, and others can come along and layer uh, what we know about human migration and discuss the, the mig migratory patterns that we think people were using, that we see people using. One of the things I just learned about just last week, my colleague Solange Ashby, who um, is, she sort of straddles the fields of Egyptology and Nubiology. She's a little bit of both. Um, Solange was just telling me last week about something I had never heard of, which is called um, Mega Lake Chad. And so Lake Chad, which exists today, in ancient times was much huger than it is today. It was a huge um, freshwater sea, larger they say than, than the Caspian Sea is today. And so I started looking at this after she told me about it and um, there's satellite imagery from NASA where you can see you know, sort of Lake Chad today, which is this big and the boundaries of mega Lake Chad and um, the, the, the banks of it are still visible in satellite imagery that NASA has posted. So that's another example of how, um, how easy it would have been for ancient humans to migrate across this area that we think of as, as not being easy to traverse today because you would have had watering spots like this that would have facilitated movement. Mm -hmm. But also in the study of uh, ancient antiquity, is it possible that we can also look at language as if it were a map to sort of help us understand where people are coming from and where they are going to? Because I think uh, the notion that ancient Egyptians just suddenly became Egyptian, uh, it doesn't really explain where they are coming from. Maybe if we go deeper, we can see that they are actually not coming from Egypt, but they are coming from other part of Africa. Because at the end of the day now, there is only, I mean, scientifically speaking, there is only one group of human species that exists today, which is the human being that we have today. 
and all of us came from one source. So is it possible that we can trace the, the language to find something about that? I, I think that's possible. I am not one of those people who works on language in that way. So my knowledge of it is very limited, but there are people who do work on that. So I mentioned um, Andrew Jags and Chris Eret and Sandra Capricci. They all work on ancient language systems in Africa and they are able to make those connections to, to understand um, where languages come from in terms of geography, where they're moving to, the, the words that are borrowed from language to language. Um, so what you've described is, it is possible to do that and, and people are doing that. I'm just not one of those people. <laughs> okay. Actually, where, where I wanted to go there is, um, um, is the fact that um, there is a debate whether Egypt is actually Africa, no? Because if we that, because if you you are in the US, no, you are a US um, uh, citizen, you understand what I mean. That in the US you have African study, then you have uh, Egyptian study, which make you believe that as if you, you are talking of Egypt, you are talking of a different people other than Africa. So then it become a little bit confusing for me uh, when you are you as an Egyptologist, are you talking about African history, or are you talking about people other than Africa? So I'm not yet clear on that. Yeah, what you've described is a big problem um, in the way that people in the US um, and elsewhere in Europe talk about and think about these cultures. When I talk about Egypt, when I talk about ancient Egypt, I'm talking about Africa. But you are absolutely correct that there are some people and some institutions as well, like museums, for instance, or universities, there are some places where you will find that separation that you just described, where people will speak of Egypt um, in ways that, that separate it from Africa. Um, and there, there are many reasons for that. I'll, I'll try to sort of summarize them quickly. But I mean, it has a lot to do with uh, Western colonialism, Western imperialism, and sort of a claiming of the space of Egypt by Western powers, you know, first physically, of course, as, a, as it was a colony, but also intellectually, where Western scholars of, you know, 150 years ago, let's say, we're, we're claiming that space of ancient Egypt as part of a Western heritage. Um, and, and so they made it not African in a sense. That's how they spoke of it. That's how they wrote about it. And that's how it sort of came to be understood by the public. And that, that's obviously not correct. I mean, it's very clear when you look at a map that Egypt is in Africa, but it's also very clear when you look at ancient evidence that the cultures of the Northern Nile Valley were very much African in their cultural heritage. And we see that with all the cultural similarities um, between the Northern Nile Valley and elsewhere in Africa. I mean, there in the United States, there was, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, there were very incorrect views that Africa had no history. And African-Americans in the United States who, who were fighting this narrative would point to the ancient cultures of Egypt as proof. But yes, there's obviously a history to Africa. Look at everything that exists in Egypt. And at that time, not not a whole lot was known, comparatively speaking, about um, ancient Sudan. And so, so typically they were pointing to Egypt, but on occasion, these scholars would point to Sudan as well. And now we know so much more about the ancient cultures of Sudan. And so we're able to point more fully to those cultures. And we're beginning to know more about ancient cultures elsewhere in Africa. So, so we can continue to build this narrative out. And it's important that we do that. And all of that together can help, um, you know, can help change this idea that Egypt is somehow not of Africa. It most definitely is part of, of ancient African history. 